Our lives are filled with stories, stories of magic, mystery, and melancholy. But tonight, you will hear a story unlike any story you've ever heard before. It's a story about composting. I hope by the end of my talk, you will realize there is so much right about my story. It's a story about growth, a story about perseverance, a story about the triumph of good over bureaucracy, and a story about love for one's home and community. One small idea kept growing. I simply made choices based on what I wanted for myself and my community, yet I am humbled by the ways my story has resonated. No one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Little things add up and become big things, sometimes right before your eyes. So although this is a story about composting, it started with my home, my haven. My love of organic food led me to gardening. Wanting to get closer to my food, I kept expanding. Could I can the tomatoes and make my own sauce? The answer is yes. <laughs> When I learned about colony collapse disorder, I became a beekeeper. Then I added chickens. That organic garden, I now grow a little bit of everything. Garlic, kale, tomatoes, figs, you name it. Over 40 crops this past year. My 92-year-old neighbor asks, how's your farm? <laughs> Except that the entire lot is less than one-tenth of an acre and less than tw and 21 feet wide. This past season, I donated over 100 pounds of food, shared with neighbors, and kept plenty to feed my family. I doubt that would have happened without the benefit of compost. Backyard composting was always part of the garden, but when I learned of a master compost class, I signed up the day registration opened. Participants had to do six hours of volunteer work, mostly sitting at events. I wanted to do something that had a little more impact, but what? The borough of Westchester is 1.8 square miles and home to about 18,000 residents and another 17,000 university students. So I started pestering the borough's sustainability coordinator, Megan Fogarty, about some kind of compost project. We began talking and started to talk about community compost bins. But then one night, as we drank more wine, <laughs> the ideas kept getting bigger. We talked long term. Wouldn't it be great to establish a curbside residential food scraps collection program? But how to get there? We hatched an idea for a pilot program to gather baseline data. Starting with restaurants made sense because we could capture more vol volume with fewer participants. So here's the reality about food waste. 40% of food in produced in the U.S. goes to waste, and 95% of that ends up in a landfill. Imagine 60 million tons of produce worth $160 billion dollars getting trashed. Food scraps are heavy. They weigh seven and a half pounds per gallon. And organic material is the number one type sent to landfills. That food is rotting, which releases methane gas, a greenhouse gas 25 percent more potent than carbon dioxide. I probably ought to mention there was a snafu or two. I learned of a grant funded by the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, that required applications to come through educational institutions or nonprofits. I am a communication studies professor at WCU, Westchester University. But by the time I learned about the grant, I only had three weeks to write the grant, prepare the budget, get all the university approvals, and get committed participants. The university wasn't even going to let me apply. Simply not enough time. I was not to be deterred. <laughs> Luckily, I won over the grant specialist, and she went to bat for me. While prepping the budget, I learned that the company that could haul the scraps for us was going to charge us more than the entire amount of grant money available. It almost killed the project. Megan suggested investigating whether the borough could serve as the hauler. 
They weren't looking to make a profit. So if we could show our project would be cost neutral, we might be able to convince her boss and borough council to let us use their trucks and workers for our little project. Brilliant. Next, I had to focus on getting three participants. Uh, the number one thing that I hear is, how is a communication studies professor behind a project like this? I should be a microbiologist. But the truth is, this project is all about communication and collaboration. Getting the right people talking with one another, curbing fears, and being a cheerleader were essential. I mean, most people understand compost. It can be as simple as leaving a pile of organic material that eventually decomposes. That's not hard to understand. What is hard to understand is composting on a large scale, how all the pieces fit together. Plus, most people don't realize the environmental, economic, and social justice benefits associated with composting. Compost is known as black gold because it is an excellent soil amendment. It reduces the need for watering, pesticides, and petroleum-based chemical fertilizers. In fact, one cubic yard of good quality compost has the same nutrients as $150 of chemical fertilizers. Those nutrients release slowly, which help reduces harmful agricultural runoff. Compost builds soil structure, and it closes an important loop. What leaves the restaurants as waste returns as food. I also learned a best practice was make it easy to say yes and make it hard to say no. We walked through a lot of restaurant kitchens and dining rooms and offered to tailor our program to each participant. So the first proposal would be to use a small, medium, and large restaurant that would divert their food scraps for six months. How did we make it easy for them? It was free to participate. We provided them with free bins, free training for the staff, free signage, free promotional materials. Pickups would be twice a week on a regular schedule. We educated them how to negotiate a reduced trash bill so they might even save money. The borough even cleaned the bins for them. We wanted them to know we wanted the project to succeed. Three restaurants did agree to participate. We submitted the grant on time and were awarded the grant, about $15,000, which is not a lot of money, but it was enough to get the ball rolling. Then we hit another monumental snafu. The Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, the DEP, requires facilities have a permit to accept outside food scraps. They denied the farm where we were going to take our materials a short-term permit. So the farm would have to go through the full application process, which in this region takes two years or more. So now we had the money, we had the participants, and we had no place to take the material. Did I mention I was not to be deterred? <laughs> we found a permitted facility and persuaded them to take the materials. The results? We diverted over 44 tons of food from the landfill. In terms of greenhouse gas emissions, that's like taking 202 cars off the road for a year. One participant reduced their trash by 60 percent. Little things really did add up, but I still wanted to do more. Megan got a separate grant to hire a consultant to investigate a permanent compost program for the borough, and they basically said we needed more data. So back to the proverbial drawing board. The EPA put out another call for another grant. I needed to show we were working toward a sustainable program, since after all, it's not sustainable to have a grant paying for everything. So this proposal included 10 participants that would divert their food scraps for 12 months. Much of the setup was the same. However, with the first pilot, borough staff had manually lift those heavy scraps into the dump truck, which is not very efficient. So this time, we proposed using larger bins that would require the purchase of a mechanical tipping arm, decreasing labor and increasing efficiency. The borough invested some of its own money, and each participant paid $600. This time, they had to clean their own bins or purchase compostable liners at their own expense. We were awarded the grant. This time, project costs were nearly $21,000, and the grant award was a little under $13,000. Everyone was putting their money where their mouth was. 
The EPA came to WCU during National America Recycles Day to publicly recognize the project and the participants. So here's something else I learned. For that first pilot, I dutifully sent out press releases and basically got zero, zilch response. <laughs> However, after the EPA ceremony, suddenly there were invitations for newspaper and radio interviews. The project was starting to get legs of its own. We finished our 12 months of collection, and I'm happy to say we diverted nearly 360 tons of food from the landfill. Assuming the average person consumes eight pounds of food and beverage per day, that's like having enough provisions to take 250 adults on a year-long cruise. We've outgrown our current methods. To continue, we'll need to work with a professional hauler, increase participation, and find a larger compost facility. Stay tuned. <laughs> However, my story doesn't end there, because there was a second part to that second grant. Since starting this project, I learned about the food recovery hierarchy. Whereas you can see that composting is preferred over sending food to a landfill, there are even better ways to avoid wasting food that have an even greater impact. Food insecurity is a real problem for 49 million Americans. Despite the fact that Chester County residents are the healthiest, wealthiest, and best educated in the state of Pennsylvania, the stats of food insecurity hit home. These are our friends and my university students. St. Agnes Day Room serves 80 people daily. Safe Harbor's community lunch program serves 46,000 meals a year. Nearly 2,000 people each month receive assistance from the Westchester Food Cupboard. And WCU's resource pantry is now assisting nearly 70 students a month. Here's that real social justice impact. According to a study by Duke University, lack of knowledge is the main reason restaurants and other organizations don't donate food. They simply aren't aware. They aren't aware of the federal Good Samaritan Food Donation Act that protects donors and recipient agencies against food donated in good faith against any liability, accepting only gross negligence and in, uh, intentional misconduct. Pennsylvania provides even further protection with the Donated Food Limited Liability Act. If nothing else, restaurants don't realize they can take a tax deduction for the cost of their donated food. I would be remiss if I didn't say that all consumers of food, that's all of us, are best served simply to avoid wasting food in the first place. That is the most preferred method of food recovery. We're getting ready to launch a campaign to educate resi residents and restaurants. And by the end, I pledged we would have at least two restaurants donating at least one food item at least once a week, which is a modest goal to be sure. But small things have a way of growing. I talked earlier about making it easy to say yes and making it hard to say no. And the WCU students are key to this. They helped design the education materials. They reached out to the agencies. They will be pounding the pavement to educate restaurants about food recovery and ask them to participate in food donation. Even better, they will pick up the donated food and deliver it. To illustrate, we had our first donation. The university president every year hosts an annual welcome back event with a catered campus picnic. This year, sustainability was a theme, and President Fiorentino asked me to speak about my project. To show support for food recovery, WCU and our food service provider, Aramark, agreed to donate the leftovers. We ended up taking over 80 pounds of food to Safe Harbor. It was a good first effort. I know that I'm intense, and when I get into something, I really get into it. That's not for everyone. However, we all consume food, and wasted food is a serious problem. So what can you do? That's the beauty. You can do as much or as little as you want. Give your patronage to establishments that support some type of food recovery. Want to do a little more? Rethink leftovers. Still looking for ideas? Organize your fridge. Become a mindful food shopper. Start composting. Be sure to follow backyard recommendations, lest you attract some unwanted visitors. <laughs> Don't have space? Try a worm bin. I would love to talk about vermicomposting, but I guess that will have to be another TED Talk. 
Can't wait? Go to wormpoop.com. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's one thing to have an idea. My story started out small. Suffice it to say, I've put in well over my six volunteer hours. Yet I marvel at how my story has evolved and seems to be inspiring others. That gives me great pleasure. So don't worry about trying to do everything, but everyone can do something. What will you do?